Good afternoon. I'm Chuck Wilmot, President of the Graduate Students Association. I welcome you to this, the third in a series of lectures on teaching in the university. Today we have as our speaker the President of Duke University, uh, Douglas Knight. Uh, our following program on March 31st, we'll, we will have Professor Wilbur McKeechee talking uh, <laughs> the title of the talk, Gladly Would He Learn and Gladly Teach, Is Chaucer's Formula Enough? On April 7th, we'll have Louis T. Benazet, President of Claremont Graduate School, whose topic is The Liberal Arts, The Battle for Amateur Standing. On the 14th of April, we'll have Carl W. McIntosh, President of Long Beach State College, with the topic, The State College, Anyone for Teaching. On April 21st, we'll have our own Chancellor, Franklin Murphy, to talk on the topic, Teaching in the University, on April 28th, we'll have a panel discussion with members of the faculty or ex-members of the faculty uh, discussing the evaluation of teaching, and we urge you all to attend these programs. Today, uh, to introduce our speaker, we'll have a man who, according to the Bruin, is rarely, if ever, here. Uh, <laughs> and to allay this malicious gossip <laughs> and demonstrate that indeed he is here on the campus with us. We have our own Chancellor, Franklin Murphy. Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen, uh, I do appreciate the fact that it's noted that I am here on the campus today. Uh, I'm not sure that the Bruin will take note of this because it's not likely they have a reporter here. If they do, more power to them. As you know, their reporters these days are examining the parking problem and uh, really important things. Uh, Douglas, uh, here at UCLA, is perhaps in comparison to Duke, uh, our priorities are slightly different. And... Uh, the major priority these days is neither teaching nor research, but where do you put your automobile? Or how do you keep from getting a ticket if you do put it there? But it is not my uh, function to discuss that important issue. Uh, rather, it is to introduce to you uh, briefly an old and dear and valued friend of mine, a co-worker in the vineyards of higher education, but. Uh, better than that, a first-rate, knowledgeable, and attractive human being. Douglas Knight uh, was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which I suppose is a useful kind of symbolic place to be born if your intention is to go into higher education. Um, uh, really, uh, very few years ago, uh, Doug is of an age where it's perfectly proper uh, to note it. He was born in 1921. He uh, did most of his work, undergraduate and graduate, at Yale, receiving the Ph.D. at Yale in 1944. He then stayed on at his alma mater as an instructor in English uh, for a year uh, and then as an assistant professor beyond that. He was an assistant professor at Berkeley in the summer of 1949, uh, and this is perhaps one of the main reasons we wanted to get him out to the, what used, in those days, I guess, was still called the Southern Branch, uh, but uh, to the campus which now looks to the Northern Branch from time to time. He was made president of Lawrence College in Appleton, Wisconsin, in 1954. Now, those of you who know the development of higher education in this country know that if you really want to be president of a large university, the thing to do is to become president of Lawrence College. Uh, it has produced presidents of such institutions as Brown, in latter days Harvard, uh, and now, very latterly, uh, Duke University. For 1963, uh, the trustees of Duke showed the very good sense of 
convincing Douglas that he should go there as its president. Uh, he, as one might imagine, uh, has taken up his responsibilities in, in what one might call educational statesmanship, if, if this is a proper word in this country in these latter days. He is a trustee of the Woodrow Wilson Fellowship Foundation, and I see him once a year at those meetings of the Hazen Foundation uh, and a variety of enterprises uh, that concern themselves uh, with the advancement of higher education in the United States. In short, he is the prototype of what a first-rate college president ought to be, scholar, administrator, uh, and uh, gifted human being. And I give you uh, President Douglas Knight of Duke University. I would be tempted, you know, to lure some of you who are backward to come forward, except that if you want to escape, it would make it more embarrassing for you. Uh, I know the temptations of this day. If I could escape myself, you realize I would. Uh, I feel as though I were a most vulnerable person this afternoon somehow, uh, realizing what uh, may be dimly in the minds, of course, not of this distinguished, learned, and uh, academically perceptive group, but in the minds of some members of this community. I assume you're aware that there is one basketball team in this country that's even better than your own basketball team, and I, uh, I was afraid that you, <laughs> you might indict me before I began on the wrong grounds, you see. We shall find out about all that later in the week, when one of us will probably be eliminated in the first round. We'll never play one another at all. This is uh, what guarantees the amateur nature of American athletics. I was grateful for... Franklin Murphy's introduction of me, particularly grateful to give him the opportunity to be here. Uh, I sympathize. Uh, we all show the proper deference to great newspapers and great universities. Uh, I still sympathize with the problems of interpretation. You know, the president often finds it hard to strike back. It is uh, easy enough for you, but he doesn't have rented space in the paper, and uh, it's sometimes hard to contrive it. So I was glad to give the chancellor a chance to speak for himself. Uh, we have to be partners in crime. Uh, we, each of us is often away from his campus. We like to delude ourselves, at least, into thinking that we're doing your job when we are. But it is not my task this afternoon to speak about that, because I am, much as I would like to, you understand, because I'm really to be concerned for my sake, and I hope for yours too, with the problem which is the abiding one, it seems to me, in our kind of institution, and a particularly acute problem at the moment and for the next 10 to 20 years. The question really of the scholar-teacher, a question which I think can't be talked about without talking also about the nature of the university today and tomorrow and in the next 10 years or so, because the profession that we're involved in is unlike medicine or the law in this, as in many other things. You can, after you have your education as a lawyer or a doctor, go out, put yourself directly into one community, carry on your practice there. You're involved in many ways. You don't have to have, with the exception of a hospital, you don't have to have an elaborate institutional relationship. You do, however, if you're a scholar in today's world, a teacher in today's world, you do not exist. We do not exist simply unto ourselves. We exist as parts of a very complex community. And that's why I felt I couldn't talk honestly at all with you about the nature of the scholar-teacher without pointing out something so obvious that in your sophistication and insight you might have missed it. The fact that you can't consider your careers without considering the nature of the places you'll be serving and it will be serving you, since after all this relation is a very complex one and one that cuts both ways, as I hope to show you in the next few minutes. By the way, I'm also hoping to 
put some bridle on usual presidential discursiveness and wind up soon enough so that if you're willing to stay out of the sunshine for a little while, you'll badger me with a few questions. This I like most of all. Uh, the gulf between us I don't particularly care for, though it has to be for a moment. But I would like to have you nag at me with some things, and I wanted to assure you I would not be going on forever. I think as you look at universities today, you have to recognize that they are serving not only what I would call their constant and permanent purpose, that purpose which is described by the scholar on the one hand and his student on the other, those of different ages and degrees of experience, if you will, and we hope of identical purpose, though they may come at it in different ways. This I call the permanent nature of the university because though nothing is permanent in our kind of universe, this at least has the reasonable tradition of 2,500 years behind it. It has, in comparison to some other things, uh, reasonable permanence, persistence. I was about to make an insulting remark about California when you saw me hesitate then. I restrained myself just in the nick of time as I was discussing permanence and change. I decided it wouldn't be kind to you after you'd let me have the privilege of coming all the way out here. Within the framework of that constant intellectual responsibility of the university, which is a responsibility of individual people, you have today variables even within the, what I'd call the normal university world. I'm thinking of, above all, the variable of knowledge itself and the constantly accelerating pace at which it changes, at least at which that face of it which is most important to us changes. It's not fair, I think, ultimately to use mass measurements of knowledge. We do, and when we do, we say that in any field that's really alive, the mass of knowledge seems to double about every 10 years. The fallacy in that, of course, is that really creative work in any living field of knowledge consists of assimilating that mass so that actually you restructure and regroup it, so that the mass you have to deal with is ultimately not twice as great, but it may be twice as complex. The demand it puts on you as a scholar or a student may be twice as urgent. I think this can safely be said, that the rate at which one has to restructure his knowledge is steadily accelerating, and that this is a real modification of the permanent nature of the college and university world, one that may someday level off again. I think no one of us is remotely wise enough to say. It shows no signs of this at the moment in any one of the really creative fields. When you add to that the obvious problem of numbers that the state of California has faced more forthrightly and for that reason alone more successfully than any other part of the country, you have modifications really, at times almost obscurings of the basic college and university purpose. But these are only one small part of what's happening to the university world today because the demands of our whole society have moved in on the university in a way that would have seemed quite incredible to those who preceded you just by a short generation, what will seem to some of you like a long generation, but just 20 or 25 years ago, it would have seemed incredible that the universities of the country would have served the function, for instance, in the arts that any major university serves today. Uh, without being vain about it and without taking anything away from the commercial support of the arts that there is in this country, I think it still is true that if the major colleges and the major universities did not support composers, painters, poets, our country would be desperately lacking in them. The concept of the artist in residence is one that really has emerged in its full life in this last generation. Thank heaven it has because we've given not shelter and protection, but at least a chance for survival to men who without some protection can't survive at all because often their society doesn't know enough to give them the chance to survive. Universities have done this. It's greatly to their credit, but it's a radical extension of what used to be regarded as the proper function of a university. We've been involved, as you know, if you spend as much time on aeroplanes as Chancellor Murphy and I do, uh, you'll know you're always meeting your colleagues on them. Uh, those who are supposedly remote and removed academics spend a great deal of their time giving advice, counsel, consultation on every conceivable field of significance and insignificance at times. 
In any case, we consult until we're desperately weary of it. And this is expected of the university by its society. I imagine if you were to have a tabulation of the number of academic men and women whom the White House lures in in the annual, every year, should we say, to consult with someone of its special groups on one thing or another, you'd understand why half of your faculty is never here when you expect them to be. They're all in Washington. And if they're not in Washington, then they're in New York or a few other benighted parts of the earth, giving advice illuminating their society theoretically because it demands that they illuminate it. This is a kind of pressure on the university world. I shan't weary you with detail about the overseas and international demands that are made on us, but the fact remains they are not only important but inescapable, and they often take away not only presidents and chancellors, but senior and distinguished members of the faculty who have to go and create new universities, if you will, to take the most obvious example of what's done overseas, simply to create universities where there were none before, in parts of the world where we think that the good of human beings and the national interest suggests there ought to be a university. Now that's a gross oversimplification of a very important, very complex function that the university world serves. But you need to know it and recognize it to understand some of the pressure that there is today on our kind of institution pressure that often distorts it, certainly pressure that changes and reshapes it into something quite different from the university that many of us grew up with. I would add to this, I think, the tremendous demands of publicly oriented and supported research in every major field, and not only in the sciences where you see most of it, but in many other major fields. And I would also remind you finally of the operation of major services like your own great medical center here, or ours at Duke, which actually represents nearly half of the annual operating budget of the university, though it's only one segment of it. And it represents an aspect of it that would not, in budgetary terms, have looked remotely 20 years ago like what it seems to be today. I say seems to be, you know, because no president ever quite believes what he reads in his own budget. But it looks as though I were to find myself responsible for 23 or 24 million dollars worth of medical center every year, just as a living actual daily event. This is obviously a relatively new function for the major universities. We have had medical centers. They have not been enterprises of this magnitude until the last 15 or 20 years. And there is no easier quick end to that magnitude, as near as I can tell. This is the matrix in which all of us find ourselves. Those of you who are senior members of this faculty, those of you who are going into the teaching profession, those of us who have both teaching and administrative jobs. This, if you will, is the something of the nature of the fantastic organism in which those of you who are still in graduate school will be even more fully involved within a very few years than you are right now. You may think you're heavily involved now. You haven't seen anything yet. Eventually, you will be even more fully involved. Now, it's within this kind of multiple and difficult and often overwhelming as well as dazzling world that the scholar-teacher has to find his way. And it's within that setting that I'd like very briefly to tell you a little of what I think his purposes and his perils and his rewards actually are. In other words, my real concern is with all of us as individuals, I must confess, in one aspect or another of this calling but I felt that I couldn't say anything that would be in touch with reality at all without setting these remarks in the context of today's university. And the very things I've said to you today are, I suspect, going to be outmoded day after tomorrow. The university will be one step more complex than it is now. I would remind you, I think, that just as there is one aspect of the university that is permanent and unchanging, so there is one aspect of the scholar-teacher's life that's permanent and unchanging. And I put it first, and I will probably also put it last, because it seems to me the absolute heart of the matter. This is the pursuit of active wisdom and judgment, as well as expertness in a field or a cluster of fields. We always assume the second half of this. We assume the expertise in a field or a cluster of fields. I don't think that at a, the moment we're as likely to assume the pursuit of active wisdom and judgment. It's not always clear that at the moment this is regarded 
as the proper province of the scholar teacher. I'd like to suggest to you this afternoon that it is not only his proper but his necessary province if he is really going to be doing his job. We all know that it's harder to be wise than to be learned, just as ideas come harder to us than bibliographies do. The fact remains that learning in itself, important as it is, is a means, an inert means, and no more than a means to the end of wisdom and insight. And I think unless one is willing to say this, he is not really talking about the university at all. Whatever the institution that believes only in learning without the possibility of wisdom, I like to believe it's not a university, at least one of any stature and standing. Once you say this, you have to recognize that you're talking about a human community with all its headaches and all its heartaches. It seems to me that we have to judge ourselves as we look at ourselves in our own calling. We have to judge ourselves and we have to recognize that we are judged by our power to create and to live inside the sort of community I described. We have to judge ourselves first as specialists, each one of us is, as people who belong to some particular sub-guild of scholars, because each of us does have his cult, after all. But I like to think beyond that we have to judge ourselves as we judge others, by the extent to which we are educated people who are going to try to help others become educated people. And I put it very simply and in a very old-fashioned way because it happens to be fatally easy to forget this simple, appallingly difficult job of trying to be educated people ourselves whose vocation it is to help other people be educated. To put it in another way, the community of scholars, the real community of scholars, can be called such only because it is a powerful part of a larger community and has genuine influence on a larger community. And I shall return to that in just a moment or two, because I think to some extent we underestimate the kinds of influence we can have. I talked about all our busy work a few minutes ago, all our consultations and all our whizzings around the world, but there is something much profounder than that that we have to contribute to our society. Because of the pulls and tuggings and stresses that I've just described to you as being part of today's university world, I think that there are a few perils and difficulties that if I'm going to be honest with you, I ought to speak briefly about as inevitable aspects of graduate work today, inevitable aspects and tempting aspects of the university world, I guess for your elders as well as for you. The first, of course, is the inevitable distortion of knowledge itself that's built right into the years of graduate study. I like to think we recover from this eventually. But any one of us, if he's at all honest about his graduate work, knows that there was a time when those three courses represented the limit of viable learning, when his dissertation was not only the most important thing in the world, the most important discovery that had ever been made, but by virtue of that, obviously a good deal more real than anything that anybody else was working on. And this is the peril I speak of, that strange sense that nothing else has quite the same reality as the small bright point where we happen to be. One hopes it's a bright point. It may just be darkness visible, of course. This is a, a live possibility. I can remember times when I was writing my dissertation when it was very clear, looking back at it, that I was producing nothing but darkness visible. But to me, it seemed like light at the time, I must admit. In short, the world for those years distorts itself and is distorted by the inevitable specialization through which you acquire your competence, through which you prove that you're worthy to belong to your particular guild. I'm not criticizing that method. I just think perhaps we need to be reminded a little more often than we are that the tiny fragment of reality we have hold of doesn't really represent the universe at all. If you're lucky, it may represent one remote corner of the universe. And if you're very lucky, someday, 40 years later, your work may represent a rather central corner of the universe. But the thing that's not always built into graduate work, even at its best, is an awareness that each of us has merely his corner and not the whole. Again, it's a point so simple that in your wisdom you may have missed it. That's the only reason why I mentioned it. And after all, that's the function of university presidents, you know, ultimately, is just to articulate the simple things that they're 
friends don't have time to bother with. See, I, before I'm done, I'm really going to give you a definition of the president as well as of the scholar-teacher. I apologize for that. I would like to suggest that a second peril that all of us face at the moment, and I hope you won't think me a fuzzy-minded idealist for saying this, is what I would call both the economic and intellectual cynicism that is defined and indeed in part created, unless I'm much mistaken, by recent books like The Academic Marketplace, which honestly do not represent either the way scholars are chosen or the way reputable scholars act. I'm sorry, I hate to indict two men in a distinguished field of sociology, but uh, that's a miserable book. And worse than that, it's probably a vicious book. And it certainly is a perversion of the way that any department in this university or any other first-rate university really goes about picking its faculty or valuing its faculty. Now, the danger in it is that you yourselves will think that somehow the profession really has about it no genuine standards, if you will, no ideals for its own performance. You may even come to feel that the economic rewards of your profession are the most significant thing about it, and I've got a very unpleasant remark to make about that in a moment. But before I get to it, I would like to tell you a story that comes not out of the educational world at all, but out of industry, which is supposed to be concerned with nothing but the marketplace, the economic marketplace. I happen to have a, a dear friend, and I can say this with feeling because he's the new chairman of the Duke Board of Trustees. Uh, he'd better be a dear friend if we're going to get the things done we have in mind for the next 10 years. He happens to be, he happens also to be an unusually capable lawyer and the, the legal counsel for one of the country's four or five largest corporations so that he has a hundred other lawyers or so who help him keep uh, his own tangled affairs straightened out. And we were, we were discussing some of these very questions a few months ago that I'm talking with you about this afternoon. And he said he had recently had a, an example of the kind of marketplace negotiation that he hoped might illuminate what was going on in the educational world. He had had two very able young lawyers come to talk to him about jobs. And one was very curious about what went on in this particular company, what their major problems were, what they expected to be doing five or ten years from now, and what this would mean to a young lawyer who expected to be developing in his field and actually wanting to have more impact on his society than he did at the moment in the job he was doing. The other came and said to my friend, you know, he said, I've got a really a pretty good job where I am. He said, and my salary is 12 5 now, and I have to think of the costs of moving. It'll take so-and-so to move me. The chairman of my board found it rather easy. He said, you won't have to worry about all that because you're not moving, as far as I'm concerned. I'm not interested in your price. I'm not interested in you at any price. And his decision was made on the same ground that I think any honest man has to make a decision in his own field. If the price is what matters to you, then you don't belong in the business. And I say this in the face of enormous economic pressures. We're all of us in the university world busy competing with one another for your services right now. And we are constantly raising the ante for those of you who are good, even for those of you who are mediocre. And I might as well be honest with you about that. The fact remains but as far as I'm concerned, if you are interested first in the retirement benefits and second in what the students are like and third in what the administration believes the purpose of the university is to be, I'm not interested in seeing you on any faculty that I'm responsible for because when the heat is on, you will not be doing the job that you ought to be doing. You will not be concerned with first things first. And I just suggest to you, I'm not, I don't mean to preach at you, you forgive me, but I suggest to you that at the moment there are so many alluring pressures on all of us that the temptation to put third things first can often be a very seductive temptation indeed. And I'm as guilty as all the rest of you, don't mistake me. I very often put third things first, but I hate to see my friends do it. And when I catch myself doing it and have one of those rare moments of honesty about it, it embarrasses me just as much as I hope it embarrasses you. I would suggest along with this another peril that I think you ought to be aware of, 
It's the peril of giving your final loyalty to the guild of your profession rather than the place you serve. Now, this is a very tempting thing, and it's got the most substantial of academic traditions behind it, after all. The community of scholars is something with a very long life, a much longer life than any of us will have, and a much longer life than any of our individual institutions have had. The fact remains, quite apart from the migrations that all of us indulge in in our lives, quite apart from the fact that loyalty to a field, a discipline, a study, is absolutely essential if one is going to do distinguished work in it. Quite apart from all that, you only unfold yourself as a scholar teacher when you can also believe in the institution. And I would use an even stronger and more old-fashioned word than believe, and it may seem like a very odd word to you. I would say you only unfold yourself as a scholar teacher if you're willing to try to love the place you belong to, unlovable as it may often be annoyed as you may often be with it, as you are with the people whom you love and who love you. Still, unless you have the power in some way to love it, you will never find yourself in it as a really distinguished scholar-teacher. As I say, love does not eliminate criticism. What it does eliminate is indifference. And I would remind you that indifference is even worse than hate. Indifference is the final curse. And to be indifferent to the institution you serve is the worst thing that could be said about you. This I would not wish for you, for me, or for any of us. It is a temptation at a time when one looks across the country and feels, I can take my pick of places, what will they offer? And feels, well, I may give my services here for a year, but I'll be giving my services somewhere else a year from now. I'm not trying to say you should get stuck in the mud and never move. I'm saying there is something called loyalty, and it still carries weight and excitement and value. That's all I'm suggesting. I would suggest to you beyond this the specious separation of scholarship and teaching, as though they were separate enterprises. This is something that, of course, has been enhanced as a problem in these last years simply because the resources for research apart from teaching have been so enormously increased in many fields, not in all fields, but in many fields. And this has put pressure even on the fields that formerly did not have resources for research apart from teaching. There has been a major development even in the humanities in the last 10 to 15 years, though these have not been subsidized by the government or by state governments to any considerable extent. I simply remind you of something that I hope you all know, but I want you to know I know it too. I simply remind you that distinguished teaching and distinguished scholarship are merely parts of the same venture. This does not mean that every one of you should look forward to publishing six articles a year for the next 25 years. You may prove your distinction by publishing two instead and having something to say in the two you publish. That, after all, is one of the most demanding things the scholar faces, to know when not to say the trivial and the second rate this is the hardest thing of all, particularly when it's rumored that your elder colleagues really weigh what you produce rather than reading it. Now, I want to assure you that actually they read it as well as weigh it. But I'm saying that you've got to have enough nerve to stand up and say, I have two good ideas at the moment. I will write articles about those two things. I can see my way to one book that's only 170 pages long but it will be twice as good a book if it's 170 pages long as it would if it were 340 pages long. The law of diminishing returns I commend to you in everything you write. But I'm also suggesting that the best of ideas as the scholar sees them and as he expresses them in his own work, for the most part, tend to come out of your encounters with other human beings who are also people of ability and competence and integrity. And you know... Uh, some of my friends have gotten loose on this problem, too, and they find, curiously enough, that even in the theoretical sciences, where one at times is told that the more time a man has, the more ideas he can have, the most productive men, again, measuring in terms of mass, but the most productive men have another responsibility in addition to their research responsibility. They are, in fact, men who are teaching, or even, God save the mark, men who are doing administrative work I claim that those men simply retreat to the laboratory for sanity, and there they find an idea. But I haven't proved it yet, so I'm not going to write a paper about that. I do suggest to you, however, 
that the separation between the two aspects of your calling is a purely specious separation. Each of us has to define the relationship for himself. But scholarship without the community of scholars, which means the community of learners, is nothing. And if you believe in that community, then you believe in other human beings. Then you would better be with them. As soon as you're with them, you're teaching. The logic, I think, is clear and quite inescapable. I do regret, I must say, as many of you do, the development of the moment that rewards the most distinguished members of the faculty by giving them less and less teaching to do until finally, if you're a truly distinguished professor, you're not allowed near a student. I regret this, as I know that some of you, except that some of you may be just those distinguished professors, uh, I regret this development because I'm not clear where the scholar teachers of the next generation are going to come from if they don't meet the most distinguished scholar teachers of this generation. That bothers me more than somewhat. One can talk too much, I realize, about the perils of your calling, but it seems to me important to realize that there are, in, in everything we're drawn into, in everything we commit ourselves to, certain limits, certain genuine dangers. I would remind you, on the other hand, of one important thing about this calling. It's one complex thing, and it's something about which people have been much too sentimental at times. It's a description of the reward of this particular calling we're involved in. I have no desire to be sentimental with you about it, but it honestly seems to me fair to say to you that in this profession, you will have more freedom than in almost any other. Whatever thing freedom means, and freedom turns out to be a perilously complex word, you will in fact have more freedom in this profession than in almost any other, either to go to hell in a handbasket or to do something that's really worth the doing. You will have genuine influence, and at times you forget this. You will be in a position to influence a great many other people in one direction or another. And you might as well not go into the calling pretending that you carry it on neutrally, because your very neutrality will be an influence, I can assure you. So you can't escape that problem. You will be people of genuine influence in this calling, and you won't, there's no doubt about it. And you will have it in your power to bring ideas to significant life. This is something that can't be said of a great many callings in this world, that through them you have it in your power to bring ideas to significant life. I assume you would not be here if you didn't have some genuine understanding of that fact. I just want to assure you that it's true about your calling from now until the time you retire and even after that time, if you're really good scholar teachers. And I would simply suggest to you beyond that what I've already implied, that you have the chance built right into this profession to be loyal to something a little bigger and a little more important than your own pocketbook or your own private pleasure. And it strikes me that a good many people who are out earning their livings today don't have that privilege. We take it for granted in the university world. I'm not sure we should, because a great many of my friends who are making their living in other ways don't have the privilege of feeling that they are, can be loyal to something larger and more enduring and more important than themselves. Some of them even feel that the thing they're working for is smaller and more trivial and less important than themselves. And they are pathetic and sometimes even tragic people. You don't ever, ever need to fear that in this calling, and that's why I tell you about it. Finally, just one brief word, having said what I have about your future, I want to conclude by saying one further word about the future that all of us have together in this profession. Because one of the most striking things about it, actually, though you may not know it, know it yet, is the increasing complication and the increasing excitement, therefore, that the future is going to offer you in it. Now, if I said very much about that, it would sound altogether too much like a commencement talk to be given to high school students. I'm not going to give you that talk. But I do want to remind you of just this when I talk about the future. There are many things I could say, and I hope it wouldn't sound merely like a commencement talk. But I do want to remind you of this. After what I've said, I hope it's quite clear that I picture the scholar-teacher as having an extremely significant role to play in his society. I don't picture him as decorative or incidental or accidental. I picture him as central and integral to our kind of society. Now, I would suggest as a result of this a curious kind of definition for you 
of this strange animal that we are. And I would suggest, and I tie this to the future for this reason, I would suggest that the, the demands on our society, not just on the universities, but on our society, which is what determines the structure of universities, in the next 20 years or so, is going to make it really urgent that you yourselves understand the function that the scholar-teacher plays, not just in the classroom day by day, but through the classroom, through the library, through the laboratory, in his whole society. And this is what I want to suggest just in eight or ten words. It strikes me that you can only understand the scholar-teacher by a series of paradoxes, which for me run something like this. He's a man who is not first-rate in this field of ours, unless he has about him some power to be a visionary on the one hand. And yet at the same time, if you'll forgive the word, a man of direct and practical influence on the other. And if you doubt this, really look at your most distinguished colleagues, and they are both, and they have had to make a reckoning with both ways of coming at the universe, the way of vision and the way of very hard reality. This same man must often, if he's to do his job and be, a, be an honest man, he must often be the critic of his society. And one reason why presidents spend a good deal of their time protecting faculty members who may, in some people's eyes, have done absolutely idiotic things is so that we will be free to be the critics of our society when our society calls for criticism. At the same time, this is only part of the story. So far as our society has an establishment with a capital E in it, and that's one of the fashionable cliches at the moment, of the moment, I don't think any of us can identify that establishment, but so far as our society does have a group of men who, through their common interests and through their freedom of access to one another, shape our society, then the scholar-teacher has a central part to play in that. I could document this, I won't, but it happens to be quite true. And the evidence for it goes back to that matter of advice that I was telling you about some time ago. The amount of academic advice given is merely the outer reminder of the amount of inner influence that today's scholar-teacher has on the conduct of life in his society. He really does have it. He has more of it than those of you who are still in graduate school know at the moment. I would remind you of just one more paradox about men in our calling, that we are devoted, no matter what our field, first of all, to the past of things, to what has already been known. But we are devoted to the past in a sense that no one else understands it, deals with it in. We are devoted to the past as it is constantly altered, reshaped, and overthrown. We are devoted to the past as it creates the future. We have this particular obligation. This is a philosophic and metaphysical obligation, if you will. It's also a factual description of the way that really creative scholar-teachers work. They constantly modify the past. And in doing that, in modifying the past of knowledge, they actually shape the future, not only of knowledge, but of the society they inhabit. And this, I think, at times we tend to forget. I suggest to you that in the future we would forget it as our peril. At our peril, I would also suggest that even though I don't know how you picture yourselves or your university, I don't know what you see as you look at yourselves in UCLA, but it seems to me that if you don't see some of these kinds of influence that you can have, and the kinds of responsibility that you will have whether you like it or not, then you still have to discover the real meaning of graduate work even though you're doing it, and the real meaning of any major American university, which I recognize is often so hidden, so complex, so various, that there are dark Tuesdays when one wonders if it has any meaning at all. I would like to suggest to you as I close that it has a great deal of meaning a great deal of influence, a great deal of power, and it's going to have more before it has less, let me assure you. I merely want to ask you to relate yourselves to that kind of responsibility, to that kind of calling, because that is really what we're about. And I thank you very much for your patience in listening to me. We've got a few minutes, even though we started late, I hope, in case you want to have at me and tell me how impossibly wrong I am. Other people do. You may too, you know. Let me get away from that and come down here. Put that down there, please. Yeah. President, I believe it was President Keeney of Brown University who recently advocated the establishment of a national organization for the support of the humanities and the arts. And I wonder if you would comment on the progress of such a proposal. Yes, I'd be happy to comment on it. As far as I know, what the present progress is. Uh, like a 
thousand other things, that's somewhere in the congressional mail at the moment. Uh, I'm giving you a factual answer, first of all. I think there's another, uh, another question that lies behind the one you put, which is also important. Uh, but what lies behind the attempt to establish is the desire, really, to reestablish intellectual parity in the universities of the country. And this seems to be an extremely important purpose for us to have. We need to recognize, again, that no one field of study is inherently more important than any other valid field of study. What makes it important is the urgency of a particular moment or the confidence and excitement and drive of the people who are, at any given time, the moving force in it. And you may well get a point in society where you're most able to create a people will show up in theoretical physics, certain aspects of game theory of the life. I think, though, this is more often the result of outside pressures and urgencies. And what we really need, whether you ever set up a, a national, you know, a national humanities foundation or not, what we really need is enough sensitivity and awareness inside every major university in the country to the equal need of all fields so that we can protect the most imaginative scholarly work in the humanities and in the arts. It doesn't cost that much. This is an odd thing for a president to say, and I will regret it in the fall, I know. It doesn't cost that much. It happens that there is good financial reason for the very heavy governmental support of the sciences. The hardware, as all of you know, is incredibly expensive. It would be very difficult for any one of us to provide it. I would suggest that for a tenth or a fifteenth the same amount, one could accomplish the same thing from an intellectual point of view, in terms of the number of scholars reached, the number of men and women free to go and do something important and exciting. All I say is that whether we do it at the national level or through the individual universities, we must do it. This I'm quite clear about. And without it, you get over a generation an imbalance, it seems to me, between the physical and biological sciences on the one hand, the social sciences and the humanities on the other. It's not an imbalance that represents reality at all. And it surely is not an imbalance that anyone in the sciences is happy with. I confess to you that I find more concern about this at times among my friends in the physical and biological sciences than anywhere else. Because after all, they happen to be sensitive and educated people too. Uh, many of them are as confident in the arts as those of us who like to think we practice the arts. They have no more desire to see the arts starve to death than I do. Give me such a long answer, but it's a very important question. And you see one way or another, we've got to solve this one. Yes. Uh, you mentioned in your talk, and also in your answer to this question, the huge amounts of extracurricular funding which are now characterizing the, particularly the scientific areas of right. large universities. Right. Of course, uh, these fundings raise a galaxy of problems. Uh, one that concerns me most, I've learned to be way to comment, is that uh, the scholar uh, teacher is faced with an ambivalent situation about university uh, in that he is, his advancement to some degree and his rewards in a material degree are based on the uh, scientific uh, research potential and output, while uh, his teaching is, is equally important, but there, there's not a kind of reward for this. I was wondering what your answer would be for uh, someone faced with these uh, uh, problems. So, uh, what, uh, how does one achieve a balance between teaching and research? Well, now, are you thinking of the fact that since a man can get, for instance, grants for uh, say to the National Science Foundation of the National Institutes of Health for two ninths of his regular salary, if he happens to be in one of those fields, that there's an automatic, sort of almost automatic salary differential. Is that the kind of no, thing? No, I'm more worried about the fact that uh, advancement, whether we like to admit it or not, is based to some degree on uh, research output. Uh, yeah. you know, although administrators. I want to be sure which oh. thing you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, these are the things that are rewarded uh, externally. From teaching, you get an internal feeling of accomplishment. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're, they're facing the business. Well, uh, let me just say this. It's only one man's opinion. It's only the way one man makes his judgments. Uh, I think it would be grossly unbalanced of me, say, when I'm making a judgment about somebody, to take into account only that kind of productivity that would be represented by these opportunities and these grants. 
I guess what I was suggesting a moment ago was that I wanted to make the opportunity for that kind of work available to any member of the university faculty who could take advantage of it. Then it could more legitimately be one aspect of the way in which you judge people. You're suggesting at the moment there's an unfairness built in here. Uh, I am saying that the judgment still has to be made of the total creative effectiveness of a human being. And I would include the teaching myself in that, no matter whether the man were getting all kinds of grants from NIH or not. If he used them wrong, in fact, it might suggest to me he wasn't a creative guy. Doug, may I ask a yeah. subsidiary question here in connection with this? Because I think it does involve the institution in a very complicated way. And I may not have been uh, 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 I'm not sure. I a did. person who has the recognized capacity to uh, uh, secure a grant for his institution from one of these agencies will, for that reason, no matter what his capacity is as a teacher, have some attraction for his institution because this will help the image of the institution eventually. It will be that much, they're doing this kind of work that is uh, looked upon as being socially useful. Isn't this an extra complication of the problem? I think it is, and I think that it helps me understand your question a little better, because you were really talking about the same fear. You see, I had gone back to relating fields that had opportunity and fields that didn't. I think this is perfectly true, Mark. On the other hand, uh, there are enough headaches in it. So if you want to know how the hard-headed administrator looks at it over a period of years, he isn't automatically delighted every time one more enormous grant comes in from NIH because there are enough built-in burdens and drains in the thing, as well as rewards. So that we tend to look rather critically at these if they're not productive, if they're just busy work. We tend to get stuffy about it after a while. I think that's what I meant when I said if a guy weren't really imaginative of what he went after, just get it in any first-rate place would not advance. You may think you know cases to the contrary, but in fact, just getting it by itself, when it's that easy to get, you know, Incidentally, at the moment, it's not that easy to get. Washington is in a more critical phase. But it may be again a year or two from now. Yes. Yeah. Me as I try to wrestle with. 
Uh, I think the only way to do it is in terms of a set of priorities that you have to carry in your head. When a request comes up, say to provide a public service of one kind or another, you have to say two things. A, what will this not only create a uh, contribute to the community, but what will it do to the community at large? Or what will it do inside the university community? Something positive and stimulating, or something negative because it uses up what is, after all, a finite amount of energy and a finite degree of resources. And it's very hard to generalize about that, but I think that a university, in order to save itself from becoming <coughs> nothing but a shell, has to be free to say at certain times, this is a wonderful thing, but we cannot pay the price to do it. Because if we do this over here, the central job of teaching and scholarship, the community, if you will, the internal community will suffer. And there are points where one can see that and can say it. Because you know, you get requests for the most fantastic things, I know you know. And some of them, uh, the university doesn't have to get involved in it at all except by renting out its facilities or lending them when they wouldn't otherwise be used. Some of them take enormous amounts of faculty and perhaps student time and energy. And there, I think I will be as cautious as you imply to me that you are. At least I will try to. May I ask a corollary question in this right. connection? Do you consider a state university to have any special obligation to society beyond what a private university of the same stature? I consider it's more vulnerable. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know that the obligation is different because you know private universities are public servants too. We are tax exempt after all. This is a rare privilege. We don't pay taxes on the capital gains in our endowment funds. This is a very rare privilege in today's society, as you well know. We have to justify that not by service to some constituency that comes nagging on Monday morning, except uh, the alumni <coughs> constituency, which is special. Uh, seriously, we have to serve it, perhaps in a region, not just a state, perhaps to particular groups of people, as, for instance, a highly selected group of students. This still is a public service. We have to define it, then we have to live up to it. And we have, perhaps, uh, in the private universities, just as complex public responsibilities. They may seem more selective on the surface, but they may be just as far-reaching and far-ranging. I think we're equally vulnerable, let me put it that way, now that I begin to talk about it. I think we have equal obligations. The kinds of pressure brought on us are different. They come by different paths, but we all get it. And we all have to fight to protect the integrity of the place. I think this is a last for the Yes, sir. We've been talking mainly about the public service relating to the sciences as opposed to the liberal arts. Would you comment on the responsibility of the academic community in permitting this tremendous disproportion? Well, uh, I think you may have noticed from what I have said a few minutes ago that I'm concerned where the disparity exists to see that we set it straight again. Just for the sake of the intellectual community itself, my comment on it, I suppose, comes in the form, really, of a commitment, uh, which is about all any individual man can say. I mean, in my own case, as far as I have any influence over the structure of things in one university, we're trying at the moment to find out what's needed in every field. And without starving A to feed B, we're struggling to make sure that both A and B get fed. But I wonder if I could say just one more thing about the humanities at the moment, because I happen to be in that field myself and would have a right to say this. I think that as a physicist, I would not have a right to. It strikes me that often those of us in the humanities are a little bit more defensive than we need to be, and we're a little bit less dry than we could be. And we don't make quite as clear as we might the relevance of our own disciplines, our own fields of study, to the world that we have to confront out that door. They are profoundly relevant. And our friends in the sciences know it, as I suggested a few minutes ago, sometimes better than we do. They don't have any doubt about it. But we almost act like second-class citizens every now and then in the humanities. Now, I'm not saying we've had all the research money we could have used. The fact remains, we've got magnificent libraries, and those are the research tools, after all, of those of us in the humanities. 
we can get time within limits, ever as much as we'd like. I think what we need is what Mr. Alden calls, and a few other people call, change of mind. In other words, I think part of the remedy of this balance lies in those of us who are responsible for the disciplines. We've got to prove their relevance. Oddly enough, that in itself will help provide the money. I won't weary you this afternoon by talking about that gross matter of money, but I can tell you this, and I've spent quite a few years looking for it in the world. Money for worthy things has to come after your identification of the worthy things. If you go out looking for money, oddly enough, all the money has disappeared. If you go out with an idea that's worth entertaining, oddly enough, you will find somebody who will help with it. This may sound horribly simple-minded to you, but I've been doing it, and it's worked. I want to recommend you, you know, I think that's why individual scholars have some obligation to go out and look for the money for their own projects, because they can tell the story as nobody else can tell them. And when you go with a gleam in your eye and you say, you don't know anything about this, but I do, and it's important. It's got to be supported. People listen. And they don't listen to anything else if they're intelligent, sophisticated people. And those who have money, oddly enough, a great many of them are intelligent, sophisticated people. Some may be very odd people, but they're also quite sophisticated. And the thing they respond to is your own honest zeal. And the only reason I mention this is that I'd like to see us in the humanities show a little more honestly than we've been showing. I think we can do it. I did want to suggest to you that those of us who are responsible for university budgets also have an obligation to help our friends when they show some honesty. There are two sides to this. Look, I've kept you very late. It's 10 after 5. You've been